Common factors versus evidence-based practice. Which is the right way to go? The most common answer that I hear from students is it's not an either or, but rather a both and. Both common factors and evidence-based practice are important to competent counseling practice. That being said, the consensus tends to be that without a solid therapeutic alliance as a foundation, you can't really pass go and counseling won't really go anywhere. On the other hand, once a therapeutic alliance is established and the counselor has a better understanding of the client's context, characteristics, worldview, and presenting concerns, it may become necessary to identify research and use theory to tailor your ways of intervening to fit with specific client needs. In practice, I integrate both of these models. I'm working primarily from a common factors model, and then I'm integrating aspects of evidence-based practice. However, I also recognize that there is a clear order of operations, and I always start the counseling process by forming a safe and supportive therapeutic alliance. As you are probably already aware, common factors research includes a number of studies that demonstrated that there are common ingredients across theoretical approaches which impact the effectiveness of counseling. Lambert's common factors model is the most commonly cited, however, Wampold's and Kujapur's common factors models demonstrate similar results to Lambert's. Lambert's common ingredients include the counseling relationship, client factors, which are things like the client's motivation, their social support, their personal strengths or resources, hope and expectancy, and theory-specific factors and techniques. I think it can be useful to even further break down the common factors research to consider what various theories have in common in terms of key ingredients related to counselors' ways of being, understanding, and intervening. For example, when thinking about counselor ways of being, common factors research has consistently demonstrated that the therapeutic relationship is a significant ingredient that impacts client outcomes. Clients need to be able to have predictable access to the counselor within a consistent healing setting, and where positive client outcomes tend to be correlated with a therapeutic alliance that is characterized by trust, credibility, mutual investment, positive emotional feelings, and a sense of feeling understood and being seen. In terms of counselor ways of understanding, common factors research has demonstrated that it is important that the counselor and the client are together able to construct a psychologically derived and culturally embedded explanation for the client's emotional distress. Or in other words, the client is able to see how their struggles make sense within a larger holistic context, and this explanation leads to some kind of new learning, corrective experiencing, or understanding, which sets the stage for growth. Lastly, common factors research has demonstrated that counselor ways of intervening need to include skills, strategies, or techniques that lead the client to enact something that is positive, helpful, or adaptive. This learning might look different depending upon the client and the theory used. For some clients, they might learn that it is adaptive, for example, to experience and express emotions. Other clients might learn that it is adaptive to identify, assess, and modify thoughts. Others still might learn that it is helpful to look at past experiences and the ways those have impacted their relational patterns. For my personal theory of counseling, I look at how these ingredients are combined so that they all stir together to impact client outcomes. I start with the counseling relationship and use Roger's core conditions as my base. This helps me to unpack client factors and better understand my clients in context through identifying relevant client characteristics. The more I understand these client factors that are unique to my client, the better I'm able to select a theoretical approach or a way of understanding that fits with the client's culture, worldview, and values. It is through the process of identifying a way of understanding with the client that I gain confidence and credibility in the client's eyes, and we both have more hope and expectancy for positive change. This in turn brings us full circle, strengthening the therapeutic alliance further. Now, some counselors in training have shared the perspective that given what we know about common factors models, perhaps theory doesn't really matter. However, I would argue that theory is actually a really important piece of a common factors model and counselor competency because it gives the counselor a framework for making connections and meanings that can provide an explanation related to some of the reasons why a client is experiencing distress. At times, it can also help to guide us towards research that can be useful in helping to inform this explanation. This explanation then acts like a map guiding the counselor to say and do things that are useful in helping the client to adaptively respond to a distressing situation. 
In this way, theory can be thought of as a way in which the common factors are delivered. As I mentioned a moment ago, we always start with building the therapeutic alliance. When examining each of the different forces, it becomes apparent that counselors practicing from different theories view and prioritize the counseling relationship in slightly different ways. However, all of the counseling approaches are using empathy, or really some form of perspective taking, to better understand clients' concerns within a holistic context. Some counselor educators, <clears throat> like me, might say that client conceptualization is actually a way to enhance empathy by thinking about the client's experiences and struggles from different lenses and angles. Theories can sometimes get us closer to understanding what it might be like to enter a client's subjective world and to walk around in their shoes. In this way, theories are more for counselors than they are for clients. When we consider the psychodynamic force, and especially the oldest theories within this force, like Freud and Jung's approaches, we can see that the counseling relationship is used to encourage transference in order to more easily access the client's subjective reality and lived experiences. A nice simplified example could be the way that psychodynamic counselors use free association. A psychodynamic counselor might say to me, say whatever comes to mind, and then use silence to encourage me to elaborate. Given the time of the semester, I would likely start to tell the counselor about all of the things that I need to get done over the next few weeks. With the new semester approaching, I have lots of anxiety about getting everything done. In this situation, the psychodynamic counselor's ways of being would probably be a little less emotionally warm. However, they would probably still use paraphrases and reflections to get me to expand on my associations. Eventually, I would likely get to a place where I talk about my fears of not having my new class prep to the standard that I expect of myself. The counselor would then be focused on analyzing what I'm sharing by asking open questions about the history that I have with this sort of pattern. Once we explored patterns from my past, starting in my early childhood, the counselor would begin making interpretations, for example, about how I might use denial that the summer is coming to an end as a way to avoid my anxiety and protect my ego. The counselor is essentially using their way of understanding to empathize with why I might be engaging in this pattern, and they're using the relationship as a means to uncover and analyze. The counselor gains credibility in the relationship by acting as an expert and by providing interpretations. Adlerian object relations and brief psychodynamic approaches tend to be more collaborative by comparison, with the counselor taking on less of an expert role, and there tends to be more emphasis placed on the therapeutic alliance compared to the older, more traditional psychodynamic approaches. When we consider the cognitive behavioral force, we can see that the counseling relationship is used to encourage the client to recognize the ways that negative automatic thoughts impact their feelings and behaviors. In cognitive behavioral approaches, I tend to think of a counseling relationship as working in a similar way to social learning theory. Basically, the counselor repeatedly models for the client the ways in which thoughts can impact feelings and behaviors. The counselor will often start out by helping the client to identify negative automatic thoughts through open questions and paraphrases. If we continue with the example about me feeling overwhelmed, I might share that an automatic negative thought I have is that even if I work constantly until the start of the new semester, my course still won't be where I want it to be. This thought becomes more intense when I start to compare the new course I am developing to courses that I have taught many times before, like this theories class. At this point, the counselor might use encouragement to reinforce my identification of negative automatic thoughts and to normalize and help me to start to identify how my thoughts might make sense given that a new semester is starting in a few weeks and this is my first time teaching a new course, which could be thought about like the activating event. As I expanded further on my anxious thoughts about the new course, the counselor would likely utilize reflections of feeling and immediacy to help me to make connections between my thoughts and how they can lead to feelings of inadequacy and behaviors like procrastinating. With repeated practice, the counselor and I would continue to go deeper into these thoughts and see how I may engage in a similar pattern across situations where I feel inadequate, helping me to uncover negative core schemas, or in the language of REBT, irrational beliefs. It is through this repeated observation with the counselor walking me through a social learning process that I learn to identify and replace automatic thoughts with more logical and reality-based thinking. The counselor gains credibility by using psychoeducation and through using a consistent framework that a client can apply to new situations.
When we consider the humanistic existential force, we can see that the counseling relationship is used as the intervention itself and the vehicle for change, rather than as a means to an end. The therapeutic alliance is seen as a vehicle that allows the counselor to enter the subjective reality of the client and to walk around in it. So instead of seeing a client's struggles as resulting from patterns learned in childhood or from distorted thinking, humanists and existentialists believe that the complexities and contradictions that people experience are inseparable from the human condition. In fact, they would say that it is the very fact that we experience these complexities and contradictions that make us human. Within the relationship, a belief is expressed that the person is doing the best they can given their life circumstances, and that people are naturally driven towards personal growth and development. However, they may not have the proper conditions to move towards congruence and self-actualization. In this way, the agent of change is the relationship itself, which provides the conditions necessary to help the client to overcome their struggles. If we were to continue with my example about feeling overwhelmed with my new course prep, the counselor would likely focus on reflecting feelings and meanings to help me to more authentically connect with my experiences in the present moment. If the counselor and I were to experience these emotions related to inadequacy together, we may start to uncover meanings that I have made about my self-worth related to my teaching. This provides important information to the counselor about what I value in an area where I find significant purpose and meaning in my life which helps the counselor to have more empathy and a deeper understanding of why I might be distressed about prepping a new class to a certain standard. The counselor's presence, congruence, and empathy can create the safety necessary for me to more vulnerably disclose, and as I disclose more, this allows me to show my more authentic reactions. As I become more congruent, the counselor continues to communicate empathetic understanding and positive regard. Over time, this process could help me to identify and utilize my freedom to choose how to interpret, make meaning, and respond to life circumstances. This might also lead to more congruence and might help me to become more accepting of myself and others. In this sense, tuning into my anxiety can give me an opportunity to make an intentional choice about who I want to become and the specific actions I may need to take in order to lead a more fulfilling, meaningful, and self-actualized life. What does all of this mean in terms of integrating evidence-based practice and research into my overarching counseling approach? Well, for me, learning to do this was a lot like learning to cook. When I was first learning to cook, I would gather recipes and make sure that I had all of the necessary ingredients. I would also spend a fair amount of time watching videos of other people cooking on YouTube, and I would try to imitate them and make the recipe exactly like they did in the video. The first time I made my partner a dish that I hadn't made before, it felt a bit rigid and manualized. The recipe didn't end up turning out the way that I had hoped, and I found it to be sort of bland. However, it was food. It gave us sustenance, and since my husband loves me, he at least pretended to like the dish. Over time and with practice, I started to feel more comfortable in the kitchen and more comfortable with creative cooking. Eventually, I was able to look at the ingredients that we had on hand in our pantry and more adaptively base my recipes on these ingredients. I also learned to spice things in a way that was to both of our tastes. Continuing with this metaphor, we might say that the different forces are like different categories or types of cuisines. For example, Chinese food could be psychodynamic, Italian food could be cognitive behavioral, Mexican food could be existential humanistic, and Indian food could be multicultural social justice. Just like the common factors model, these cuisines all contain common ingredients like grains, fruits, vegetables, legumes, proteins, and fats, oils, and sugars. Similarly, these cuisines share common elements that are used regardless of which cuisine I'm preparing. For example, all of these cuisines would use peppers, or paraphrases, in some form. How these peppers taste or are experienced within the context of the larger dish will be different depending upon the type of cuisine I have selected to prepare. Therefore, the way my peppers show up in my Chinese food will taste different from how they show up in my Italian food, which will be different from how they taste in my Mexican food, and different still from how they show up in my Indian food. Let the cooking and eating begin.